Well, this repair just got a whole lot harder. Hello Internet, my name is Quinn and this is Blondie Hacks. Now, on any sufficiently complex project, there's always going to be moments of two steps forward, one step back. I'm working on the locomotive this week and I've made what I think is the first really major mistake on this project. I've made lots of little ones, but this is the first mistake that I can't just work around and keep going. We're going to have to do some major surgery, but I think I can fix it. Let's find out. The problem first became apparent when I went to bolt the sides on for real so I could move on to the next steps on the sheet metal work. The front edges of the coal bunker and the sides are supposed to line up because there's a sheet metal piece that goes around and down the front of each side. And well, they do not line up. In fact, they don't even come close to lining up. How bad is that error? Looks like it's about 3 16 of an inch, which is a lot of error. I mean, that's an error that would shame even a woodworker. So we're definitely going to have to do something about that. That is not going to be acceptable. There's no way we can make the sheet metal fit around that much error. The first step is to figure out where that error is coming from. I wanted to check the back of the tender sides because maybe the tender sides are simply sitting in the wrong location. Now the sides are currently lined up with a little bit of a gap at the back, which is actually coincidentally 3 16 the same as my error. So that's certainly curious, possibly a coincidence, but interesting. So maybe my tender sides are simply supposed to move back and be flush with the back of the floor pan. So to the drawings and let's figure out if that's the case. But no, as you can see, there's clearly a gap at the end of the floor pan that's supposed to be there. That's shown on multiple drawings and I did some math and that is in fact supposed to be 3 16 So the back of my tender sides are in the correct location. That is not my problem. The next most likely explanation then is that the tender sides are too long. Let's double check that measurement. I'm doing all this with scales because I don't have any calipers or anything large enough to take these kinds of measurements, but this is sufficient for what we're trying to detect here error-wise. A little bit of math, math, math. And yeah, look at that. The top number is the error I measured at the front of the coal bunker, and that second number is the error I measured in length of the tender sides. Now, there is some coincidence here. I'm not actually able to measure to five decimal places with metal rulers in my eyeballs, but it's clear that this is in fact where the error is. The next question then is, where did that error come from? How did my tender sides end up too long? The prime suspect is of course the hammer form, so I'm going to check the dimensions on this thing. The hammer form is of course supposed to be smaller than the tender sides, so I'm using the measurements of the hammer form that are in the drawings. And well, would you look at that? Not all of the error showing up there, but that 20 or 30 thou difference could be just in the hammer forming itself and is also probably just error with the way that I'm measuring. So that's definitely, again, where my error is coming from. The hammer form is too long. Now, the hammer form is broken down into sections. So where in the hammer form is my error coming from? The square back section appears to have about 15 thousands of error in it. So not nothing, but nowhere close to the error that I'm seeing overall. The sloped front section of the hammer form, on the other hand, has a whopping 227 thousandths of error in it. It's almost a full quarter of an inch off. That is embarrassing. I have no idea how that is so far off, but that is definitely where the error is coming from. That little bit of error in the front section could also simply be coming from this offset here. When I sanded these corners, they didn't land right on my layout lines. Those are off by what looks like about 15 thousandths. So I can actually probably correct that at the same time as I correct the rest of the geometry errors in this hammer form. I'll double check the width as well just in case because that could introduce some complication, but the width is dead nuts on. At least I did something right on this hammer form. Alright, let's talk possible solutions. The easiest and most obvious would be simply sliding the tender sides back so that they're flush with the back of the floor pan. That would correct the error, but the final part would not be exactly to the drawings. I'll call this plan zero because, well, it's kind of a dud. I don't really like this idea because the tender sides are still too big and they're slightly the wrong shape because the tail end is too long. The angle on the slope is also not quite correct. So all of those errors are going to propagate all the way down the line for all of the other parts that still have to fit to the back of this tender. And it's going to really snowball and create headaches for myself down the road. So I need to fix this. At the other extreme, of course, would be simply remaking both tender sides. 
Now that would be a lot of work and it would require ordering new materials. I don't have enough of this expensive copper left over to try again. So while that might be an ideal solution, there's also no guarantee that I would do better the second time. And well, we'll call that plan octagon. And let's see if there's something between those two options that would yield an acceptable result and be a lot quicker and less expensive. Because the hammer form is too long, I should in principle be able to shorten it and then re-hammer form the existing parts over that new shortened form. Copper is certainly amenable to that sort of rework, so in principle this should work. Of course the devil will be in the details, but that will fix the angle and the length and the overall shape and dimensions of it all in one go. First obstacle then is going to be this sill bar that runs across the back. That is in the way of re-hammer forming the sides. Now one option would be to simply desolder that, pull the entire bar off all in one go, re-hammer form the side and put the bar back in. Let's call that plan A. I like that plan quite a bit. Of course there are screws also holding this in place, but they're tiny and they can probably be drilled out or simply ripped out and drilled in larger the second time. Something like that seems plausible. That sill bar would then need to be shortened of course to go back in. However, that's not the end of our troubles because the mounting holes for the sill are also in the wrong place. They're all shifted backwards from where they need to be. So those holes would have to be moved. Or another option, since we have to shorten the bar to put it back in anyway, would be instead of shortening the far end, shorten the near end, the end that isn't getting reshaped. And if we reshape that end by the same amount as the error that we're removing from the tail end, that will effectively shift the whole pattern forward on the copper. All of that should save a lot of work, so plan A is looking pretty good. No matter what I do, I'm going to have to correct the geometry of the former, so let's start there. I've relayed out the correct location for the curves at the tail end of this form, but working around the corner radius on the top edge of the form is proving to be very difficult. I can't really get accurate results. So what I really need to do is transfer my layout lines to the back side, which is still square cornered, and that'll be much easier. So I'll do that on the surface plate. This is a little bit silly overkill for a woodworking project, but the surface plate is a very convenient and accurate way to move lines to the other side of a part. The carbide scriber on the height gauge, of course, has no difficulty scribing a line in that wood, and then that line can be filled in with pencil lead. I transferred my horizontal and vertical layout lines from the front side of the part to the back side using that method, and now I've got nice clean references and square corners around which I can do the new layout for the new curves and new angled sides for the hammer form. I draw the curves, then connect those radii to my layout lines, and there is the new shape. That is the shape that the hammer form was supposed to have. The amount of material to be removed was small enough that I went straight to the belt sander. This is pretty quick. I only have to remove a little bit of material and the belt sander makes short work of this. Then of course after I did all of the belt sanding down to my lines, then I also had to put the corner radius back on the top because I've sanded away a portion of the corner radius. That was done with my little trim router just like you saw when I first made this hammer form. I took it outside, ran the trim router around the edges that I've modified and cleaned up the radii and made them all meet up again. And there we have it. That is the new hammer form. It's looking pretty decent I have to say. You'd almost never know that I modified it. Now if I put the copper back on and line up the edges that are still good, you can see the error in the angle, and then there's quite the large error at the small radius end. That is what we need to fix. Step one of plan A then is to get that sill bar off. My idea was that if I heat up the sill bar and the copper enough, that solder should all liquefy, flow out of there, and that bar should just drop right off of there. Or at least the solder should run out the bottom. Something like that. Something should happen was my plan. Well. Turns out, you can heat this up all you want and nothing happens. That solder is all fully liquid right now and it is just sitting in there, which in hindsight is of course going to happen. That's the whole point of solder is that it flows into very small gaps through a capillary action and then the surface tension of the liquid solder holds it in that small gap until it cools. That's why solder works. If it didn't do that, we couldn't use it for the things that we use it for. So liquefying the solder did nothing, it just sat in that tight gap between the parts and didn't move. I got a little bit of a drip at one end, that was probably an area where there was excess solder and the gap was a little bigger on that part of the joint, but none of the other solder moved. Which I guess yay me for making a really good joint clearance in there, but boo me for not being able to use plan A because it all depended on getting that sill bar off. 
I talked this over with my awesome patrons and they had another great idea. What if I simply mill away a portion of the sill bar at the front where I need to reshape the copper? Then I can mill a groove in the hammer form to clear the sill bar that hasn't been removed and it'll just fit right over there. I don't want that slot to impinge on the curve at the front because I don't want to lose that shape. So I'm going to stop short of that and I'm going to mill away that much of the sill bar so that it sits in the remaining slot, if that makes sense. You'll see this all happen. This became plan orange and step one in plan orange is to line up the hammer form on the mill so that I can mill a slot perfectly down the center of it. I did this with the pointer in my mill, lining that up with the pencil marks on the front of the hammer form. I line up one end, run it down to the other end, tappy tap tap the other end until it's lined up with the pointer and then run it back again to make sure that I'm still lined up all the way down. And now I know that the hammer form is perfectly aligned with the x-axis of the mill, and I can mill a groove all the way down this thing. Machining wood on machine tools, as you've seen earlier in this series, if you've been following along, is quite easy. To use a low flute count cutter, I'm using a two flute in this case, and run the machine wide open. Wood loves speed. Woodworking tools all run at ludicrous speed. The only gotcha really is that you got to keep the sawdust off of the machine as much as possible. Sawdust is really bad for machine tools. It gets into slides, it absorbs oil, it makes a gummy mess, and it can cause rust. So I have vacuum set up to catch all of the dust and most of the chips, and that really helps keep things clean. And then I clean the machine up after cutting wood on it. I've got a spoil board at the end there so I don't blow out the end of my slot too badly. That seemed to work just fine. And that is a beautiful looking slot. This should be reasonably close, but I expected it to be undersized. I'm kind of sneaking up on this because there was a lot of complicated math and trying to figure out exactly where this slot should be. And of course, those sills have been soldered, so they're probably not exactly where the drawing says they're supposed to be. So I did this with trial and error. I did a couple of measurements and a couple of cleanup passes to add a little width and depth as needed. I just want to get it to the point where the sill bars are not bottoming out in this slot, that they're sort of just on the free-floating side of things so that the sill bar is not influencing the location of the copper. The copper needs to be registering only on the former and not being influenced by the sill bar. Okay, on to step beta of plan orange, which is to mill away this piece of the sill bar at the front so it will be clear of the area that needs to be hammer formed. This of course has to be done very carefully. I want to mill away just the brass of the sill bar without touching the copper at the bottom. I'm also taking fairly light cuts to get down there because the fixture here is not super rigid. A lot is depending on the strength of that copper sheet to hold this sill bar in place against the milling forces. When I'm close to the bottom, I start going very slowly, like one thou and half thou passes until I get down to just where you can see the solder layer that was between the brass and the copper showing and a little bit of the copper showing below that. That's where I stopped. Don't want to push my luck. I don't want to get into the copper at all. This copper is pretty thin, so I don't want to remove any of it. That was slightly nerve wracking, but seems to have gone well. I've got just the solder layer and a few wisps of the brass sitting on top of the copper. The rest of that I can clean up with other methods. Of course, I couldn't get all the way into the compound radius at the end because the end mill would have hit the copper, but that little piece can be melted out with the torch because it's small and there's nothing else holding it in there. There's no fixturing screws or anything left to hold the piece in there. Once that solder is fully liquefied, then I can knock that little chunk of brass out of there. While I'm here, I can melt out some of that excess solder as well. Once it's liquefied from the torch, I can kind of knock it away with the pick. Some of the bigger blobs that were more persistent, I busted out my secret weapon. This is a Hako 808 vacuum desoldering gun. The heating element in this gun is not nearly strong enough to melt solder on a big piece of copper sheet like this, but I can liquefy it with the torch and then jump in there real quick and use the vacuum pump to suck it up. And then the last few remnants I could knock off with the pick. That got off 99% of it, then on the rest I just cleaned up with a Dremel and a little bit of filing. I got down to bare copper all the way along and cleaned up the detritus and any rough spots. The new piece of sill needs to sit flush in there and end up flush with the old piece of sill, of course. Now I can place the piece on the hammer form for realsies and we can see how this is going to go. Once again, I line up the back end, which is correct. That's my reference. And once the top right corner is lined up, you can see the slight angle adjustment that we're going to be making and that big adjustment at the front that's going to be completely reshaped. 
Conveniently, all my attempts to desolder things have thoroughly annealed this copper, so I didn't even have to do that. I can go straight to the hammer form and start a hammering away. That's going pretty well so far. A lot of reshaping has to happen on that nose, of course, but the angled side just needs a little bit of reshaping. I did have to do a second annealing. I couldn't quite get it done in one, so I went back under the torch once and I came back and was able to finish that up, tighten up that curve all the way around the hammer form. That is looking pretty good. Now we get to find out if Plan Orange is actually going to work. This is the moment of truth. Pretty exciting. So that curve looks good. The length in principle is now correct, but let's find out with a little bit of a test fit. If I line it up with the front edge square with the coal bunker, and then the back edge should land right on my scribe lines, right where the old back edge of the tender sides was. And it does. Excellent. That is looking really good. Score one for plain orange. Now that hammer forming created a little bit of a tail. The material pushed itself downward, so I need to file that square again. That all seems to be going great. Now I just need to do the same thing to the other side, bring it to this same point, and oh no. Yeah, this one did not go well. On the final pass of the last cut, I got a little too close to that inside compound corner on the copper, and a flute on the end mill just snagged that copper and sucked it right into the cutter. There were three separate strap clamps holding that thing to the table. This thing was clamped to within an inch of its life. But when that end mill hooked that gummy copper, that's how gummy copper is, you can see what happened. You can see the end mill hooked it right there, and then pulled it in, and then just shredded all the material on the way in. This was a disaster. At this moment, Plan Octagon was starting to look pretty good again. I was considering ordering new material and starting over. But I thought, well, maybe I can still fix it. So I went to my copper bin and let's see if I can find a little piece that I can use to replace the piece that I mangled at the end. And yeah, fortunately, I did not have any scraps. So let's check the other copper bin. And this one did have a perfectly dimensioned piece of scrap in here. That, I think, should be usable to make a patch. I marked the damaged area plus a little more and I'm going to saw off that whole section and my thought is I can silver solder in a replacement piece of material and then hammer form the replacement material and you'll never know that the damage was there. At least that's the plan. I filed that cut square to make the upcoming splice as easy as possible. Now you might be thinking this is crazy this is going to be way too difficult and complex and has low odds of success. Maybe but the thing is, at this point, you've got nothing to lose. The part is scrap anyway, and I'd have to wait a week to order more materials, so I might as well try fixing it, right? I marked up my piece of scrap. I had to kind of eyeball this and figure out how much I was going to need to leave to hammer form a flange. Turns out I should have left a little more. This looked a little short, so I added a little bit more, but it was still a little short, spoiler alert. I cut that little piece out on the bandsaw, and now I'm going back over to the mill and doing something very, very important that I know you can't see, which is that I'm drilling and tapping a tiny little splice plate on the back of this join. Here's a look at it. I'm putting a screw in the first hole that I just drilled and tapped, and when I pull this clamp back, you'll see what's going on. There you can see the repair piece and the little tiny piece of scrap that I used to make a splice plate. I drilled and tapped a hole on both sides of that, and put these little tiny number zero fixturing screws to hold everything in place for silver soldering. And I'm making sure that the bottom edge of the splice stays flush. That looks decent. So now I'm going to try silver soldering that in place. All these little pieces and the screws went through the pickle bath to prepare them for silver solder. Now everything gets fluxed and reassembled. I'm using silver solder for this because I'm going to be soft soldering the rest of this repair. The new pieces, the sill bar, and so on. So I want this piece to not be damaged by the subsequent soldering that I'm going to be doing right on top of this joint. Making sure everything stays square, get lots of flux on there, no reason to be shy with it, and away we go. In hindsight, I probably should have made this patch just way over size in every dimension, and then cut it down to size after the fact. That would have been smarter than what I'm doing here, but I got away with this, I think, as you'll see. I left myself a little flame trench underneath the piece so I can heat it mostly from the far side of the joint. You always want to do that with silver soldering whenever you can. You want to make sure that the metal melts the solder, not the torch. 
and I'm also adding some heat from above, but I'm heating the material on either side of the joint, trying not to let the torch touch the solder directly. That's a way to achieve the same goal if you can't access the underside of the part. I was not stingy with the solder, as you can see, but that looks like a really good joint. That is certainly not going anywhere once that cools. I trip through the pickle bath to clean it up, and here's where I'm at now. That's looking pretty good, certainly is strong. This is a good time to file the excess length off of those screws to get them out of the way. They're going to be in the way for hammer forming, so I want this joint to be as flush as I can get it. I filed the screws off, and then I filed the solder joint to be flush with the copper. I did my best not to remove too much of the copper. It's pretty thin to begin with. When I think I'm close, I do a guide coat with Sharpie. When you want to maximize accuracy in filing, this really helps. This tells you when the angle of your file is correct, and it tells you where your low spots and high spots are as you go. I wound up with a little bit of a low spot that I wasn't able to remove without getting too deep into the copper. There's a slight, slight misalignment of the panels at the bottom. So that I took over to the Scotch-Brite wheel and just blended it together so that the step isn't apparent, feels smooth to the touch, even if the panels aren't perfectly flush. Now that's all going to get covered, so you won't see that little bit of a low spot anyway. There's a brass trim panel that goes outside of this piece. Next I had to modify my hammer form again. I milled a little pocket to clear the patch plate, and now that will sit flush on the hammer form just like the other side did. So now I should be able to hammer form over the repair panel. That of course does not need annealing because it's been thoroughly annealed by all that silver soldering. This seemed to go pretty well. I got some overlap as you can see, and this is actually a good little lesson in sheet metal work. So I'm going to pause here. When you hammer form sheet metal around a compound curve like this, that leading edge of the material has to occupy a smaller space. That edge has to get shorter. And this is a process that sheet metal people call shrinking. You have to force that metal to pile up on itself and get thicker so that the same number of atoms, if you will, can occupy a shorter distance around that corner. You can do this with hammer forming. However, you have to make sure that material doesn't have anywhere else to go because it doesn't want to shrink and it's going to do everything it can to avoid shrinking. In this case, what it did is it overlapped the adjacent piece. It spread out over top of the joint. Now, if I had been thinking more clearly, what I should have done was hammer formed that joint in first and gotten it flush with the edge so that that material didn't have anywhere else to go. What I did instead was, in a moment of stupidity, I used my fret saw to cut the little overlap piece off. This seemed like a good idea in the moment, but what that did was it robbed me of material that should have been hammer formed into the remaining flange. And that's a big contributor to why you'll see the resulting flange that I have is a little too short. It's shorter than the adjacent flange anyway. So if I'd saved that material, that would have ended up helping to extend the flange and also would have made a better joint. I think I got away with this anyway, but in hindsight there was a better way to do it. The next step is to replace the pieces of sill that I milled away. I've milled the ends of both of those pieces square, lined them up, and scribed the curve. Then I cut that off on the bandsaw and used the die filer to shape that to fit inside the curve of the copper, just like when the sill bars were made originally. This tail end of the copper corner is a compound curve, so this took quite a bit of filing and test fitting. There's the compound curve you can see there. That's a pretty tricky piece. I would say my fit is pretty good. It's not perfect, but it's certainly within soft solder gap filling range, which is really all that matters here. Soft solder is actually pretty good at filling gaps, a lot better than silver solder is, so you can get away with a lot more on a joint like this. The next step is to put some little fixturing screws in that replacement sill piece to hold it in place for soldering. One might have been enough, but I put in two just to make sure everything is held straight and in alignment during soldering. It would be really, really saddening if this moved and ruined this repair at the very last step. Here's the two tender sides now ready for final soldering, hopefully, that will complete this repair. Fingers crossed this goes as well as I hope it will. I mean, I always hope it's going to go perfect. What does that even mean as well as I hope it will? Talking is hard. Once again, everything has been pickled and fluxed and reassembled, and now I can set it up on the hearth and get some solder in there and give it a whirl. That sill bar is 90% of the mass in this assembly, so I'm focusing the torch on that. I'm kind of bouncing the torch flame off of the brick and up into the brass 
so as to hopefully heat the brass bar without really heating the solder directly. And that seemed to go just fine. I added a little bit of extra solder on that joint at the end just to make sure, but yeah, it looks good. Then back over to the bench to file any excess solder blobs nice and flush and smooth on the bottom. Then of course those screw heads also get filed off. At the same time as I was soldering the sill replacement piece on the second tender side, the one with the second repair on it, I also soft soldered the additional gap that remained in the flange. So that solder was then filed smooth. That all went pretty well. You can see that joint is far from perfect, but it's smooth to the touch. I'll talk more about the structure of that joint in a second and how it may or may not cause further issues down the road. We've got one more thing to do on Plan Orange though. I have to plug the old screw holes and drill and tap new ones because there's no way to move the sill bar down to correct for the placement error of these. I threaded some brass bolts into those holes, then soldered them in place, and then cut and filed off the excess. Those should be permanently sealed, and now I can set up in the milling machine to drill and tap new ones. The trick with drilling and tapping these new holes is that the first hole has to be in just the right place. I tried this with various schemes of clamps in the hopes that I could transfer punch that first hole, but this really didn't work out very well, so I ended up just holding the tender side in position with a straight edge and marking that first hole by eye, and then from there I'll be able to drill and tap all the other holes on the DRO. So the whole spacing will be perfect and the tender side is guaranteed to bolt in place. The only thing that I'm affecting with my first hole position is the lateral position of the tender side. So for that, lining up my mill pointer on the scribe mark is sufficiently accurate. These new holes were all drilled and tapped. This was pretty easy. It was made a little bit trickier by the fact that the sill bar is now soldered onto the tender side, which it wasn't when I did the first set of these holes, but some clamps on an angle plate got it done. If you're wondering if those holes are off-center, they are, and they're supposed to be. The sills are offset slightly to leave just enough room at the edge of the floor pan for an additional layer of sheet metal that goes outside the copper later on. There are the two completed, repaired tender sides. They're looking pretty good. The first one where Plan Orange went off without a hitch looks really good. You wouldn't even know that repair happened except for, of course, you can see the joint on the sill if you look closely. The other one looks pretty good. Obviously, you can see the repaired area at the end. That's all smooth to the touch and that'll be covered with paint. Of course, on the inside, it's a hot mess in there, but you know, you'll never see any of that. Lots of excess solder in there and my little patch panel. All right, moment of truth. Let's get this thing installed and see if I've actually solved the problem at the front of this video. And look at that. We did. Bolted in place, perfectly flush at the front. And at the back, the tender sides are right on the lines where they're supposed to be. Grand success. Now let's talk a little bit more about this joint because you might be noticing there's a little bit of a gap there. And of course the flange is a little shorter than it's supposed to be. However, the mating sheet metal goes all the way to here. So that's all gonna be covered and it's all gonna be soldered in place. So there shouldn't be any chance of a water leak. And then the front is gonna be covered with an additional piece of brass where my finger is. So none of that repair will be visible either. As long as that repair is smooth to the touch, it should disappear when powder coated. At least that's the hope. If it doesn't, well, that's just character. It's part of the story of this locomotive. I'm proud of this repair. I wasn't sure I'd be able to do it, but I think I pulled it off and it was really an interesting challenge to try and fix this. So I'm glad I did it. I hope you enjoyed watching the process. Thank you very much for watching. Thanks to my patrons for having lots and lots of great ideas on this repair. This really was a team effort. And of course, thanks to them for supporting this content. And I will see you all next time.